for all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started. I want to get this question in here before we have to call it a day because of how many times I've gone through your Refuting Dawkins book. I think it would be good for the audience to hear because I noticed that Richard Dawkins, Dawkins likes to point to the Lenski experiment as solid evidence for evolution. And I find that you dismantle that really sufficiently in that book. Uh, so the question would be, is that actually evidence for that type of evolution people like Dawkins want to believe in so badly? See, the problem is uh, that humans have such a long generation time, say 25, 30 years, it's sort of impossible to, uh, to look at the at what they want. So what they've done is go to bacteria that can reproduce every 20 minutes or so. And hopefully with so many generations, they might be able to see some evolution happening. But in fact, for decades, you see, Lenski has done this bacterial um, experiment to look at the populations of bacteria, see what he could find. Now, he almost gave up on it because it was so hopeless. So he went to computer simulations, the Avita thing, which also doesn't make any sense either. But it's because he gave up on bacteria for such a long time. Uh, but then he found some things which could supposedly digest something different, the citrate, which it couldn't do before. But what it turns out to be, in fact, is that we have a number of uh, probably about two information losing mutations that that turn out to be beneficial. And when we look at it, look at a lot of the claimed beneficial mutations, they are information downhill. They're actually breaking something and not making something. And of course, there are many more ways of breaking something than making something. So it's not surprising. You see, all things can actually digest citrate. There's something called the citric acid cycle. Bacteria have that. But most of the time, uh, what we have, we, we do that when we've got oxygen because it's, it's um, wasteful to do it when, it's we, when we have oxygen. We've got other things we can do. Sorry, when we have oxygen, we don't normally use that because it's not as efficient. We have aerobic processes. But if we are short of oxygen, then we have anaerobic processes that use citric acid. So normally, uh, the bacterium has the, the switch. It's the citric acid thing is switched off when there's oxygen around. And only switch on when there's a lack of oxygen. But what happened, it seems like you have a couple of mutations that uh, turn the switch back on. So it now the citric acid digestion lasts the whole time. So in those circumstances, it's actually a useful thing to have this ability to, to uh, digest citrate, whether you have oxygen or not. But it's still, it's a downhill change. The, the main um, mechanisms are already there. They already existed. So all we've done is just turn on the switch so that the switch is permanently on. I mean, you can imagine if you've got a car alarm, uh, maybe you could actually deter burglars if it was on the whole time because who wants to hear that <laughs> the whole time? Right, good but point. Who would really want that alarm because I, mean, I don't want, as a driver, to have the alarm blaring in my, in my, my ears when I'm driving, you see. So we want to have an ability to switch it on, but there might be a time when a permanent on disabling the off switch might be an advantage. Right. And that's right. the best he's got. You see, at the moment, you've got two beneficial mutations that are coordinated. Both of those seem to be downhill changes. That's the best they can do is two, two mutations. Some of these things we, we need to explain um, must require millions of, of tiny changes to build up machines of living things, all things that we have to, to, uh, to live. I mean, so just getting a couple of mutations in huge numbers of millions of generations, and that's the best they've got. It's, it's pretty sad that the best they got, uh, Dr. Sarfati, as you're pointing out, are still reductive or still downhill. And mm. that's a great answer to uh, Richard Dawkins' use of the Lenski experiment. Because from my understanding, too, even though there were some uh, organismal or some bacterial adaptations observed, overall, I think his, his uh, bacterial populations are shrinking in functional genome size. I think what yeah. we're observing even in, in that experiment is devolution as, as well, we it's definitely devolution because of the, it's going downhill because uh, uh, the repair machines don't work perfectly. And um, if we're keeping them alive artificially, we're not even getting rid of some of the worst things, but we're preserving them. And then um, we get this occasional thing which has a break, breaking thing. Something's broken, but it actually does better than something that's non-broken. Right. Right. And so you're breaking down pre example We've got another thing with antibiotics. Again, uh, some this, some breaking of a germ can make it resistant to antibiotics. 
I, I like the way you say that because it makes me think that evolutionists oftentimes want to point to the phenotype when you mm -hmm. actually go down on a molecular level, go down to the genotype and you see, as you're pointing out, Dr. Sarfati, things are breaking down mm -hmm. for adaptive purposes, but it's all downhill. It's not it uphill like evolution. I'd say even on the phenotype level, it's downhill because I mean, you've got things like um, you know, blind uh, creatures in caves. So clearly, there's right. a phenotypic change of loss of uh, the sh eyes are shriveled up, and it, but it's beneficial. You don't need eyes if it's pitch black, and you don't really want eyes because you're getting damaged too easily. Right. So in a case where natural selection is not eliminating creatures that can't see, and it might even be favoring them because they're less likely to be damaged. But again, it's a downhill change going from sighted to blind is downhill, clearly. Well, that's, that's why... The problem. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. And that's why I, I look to their arguments. I feel like they have a kind of a worthless view of, of fitness because to them, I guess the way that they define evolutionary fitness, the blind cave fish or the wingless beetles, that would be a gain in fitness. Well, when in fact, they survive, you see, but they do survive. But the thing is, it's still downhill. It doesn't explain how sight or flight got there in the first place. I want right. to see how new things get there, not how some existing things get broken. Right. Like so, things can be broken. It's very easy. I mean, it's a lot of different ways a human can become blind, for instance, a damage to the optic nerve or damage to the cornea or um, retinal detachment. The optic nerve could be not formed. There's so many different ways that a human could become blind, but not very many ways a human can see, really. It's very fortunate that um, most of us have decent eyes. But it's so much many ways to break it, not very many ways to wink it. It's, it's much easier to break something than to actually build it up. To gain something novel which is all consistent with with our model of um you know a perfect creation and and the fall and and kind of just degradation and extinction um, yeah, so what we're seeing, so everything we're seeing in science is so consistent with creation and fall but often the critics don't uh, neglect the fall part of it though right they will point to something which is not quite working right now and, and say well therefore but it wasn't made right in the beginning and overlooking the fact that it deteriorated it deteriorated from its original perfection and i think even now we see a perfect concept of design but in this fallen world the concept of sight has been marred by you know thousands of years of deterioration Exactly right. It, it's, it kind of goes back to your answer to the bacteria and the viruses, you know, where they're looking at some that have maybe crossed. It's kind of like, I think of it like a hammer, you know, a hammer can be used for good construction mm -hmm. purposes, building, or of course, it can also be used for bad. And so again, you can kind of use it for bad and for good. In many ways, you can use a hammer for bad. Only one way you can use it for good. We've got a nail there, right? Amen.